we'll pick things up where we left off, continuing on with our talk on chemistry and physiology, and where we left off was with water. And so water is one of those things that essentially we need for human life. And the question, in a sense, kind of is why. And we'll look through those particular reasons as far as why we have it. We know that the human body has a large quantity of water within it. And if we were to take essentially everything else out, we'd be left with the majority of our body having water within. And with that, all that water, the majority of it contained again within cells and then kind of surrounding the cells and that is within the body itself. So when we look at water's properties, it has a few different things helping it out in terms of some of the things that we want it to be able to do. And so we ended the last one talking about polarity. And so we saw that water was a polar molecule. And with that, that allows us to kind of compare different structures with it as well. And when we look at other substances, that polarity is what allows us to have things be either hydrophilic or hydrophobic. And so that hydrophilic and hydrophobic component to them is hydrophilic being liking water and hydrophobic being not liking water. And so hydrophilic Hydrophilic things are things like our, our salt, our sugars, they dissolve within it. Hydrophobic things would be like oil. And so this is why oil and water don't mix is because the oil is a hydrophobic molecule. So certain, certain things within the body have those components to them. And so we just talked about things like sugar uh, being a uh, substance that will dissolve within it and so they are a hydrophilic type of a substance they like water um, other things things like salt and so we said sodium chloride or table salt within there we can dissolve we talked a little we'll talk a little bit about acids and bases the next time as well and acids and bases can dissociate within the water as well more hydrophobic things we have things which appear to be here something like oil so oil floating on the surface of the water that is there it does not combine with them it is a nonpolar substance and so it does not have that ability to mix with it and so we can never get that water and oil to mix together other substances are what we call amphipathic and amphipathic substances are kind of halfway in between they're uh, a little bit hydrophilic and they're a little bit hydrophobic and this is one of the most important things that we have within our, our bodies is our cells have a amphipathic layer on the outside of the cell. And so that allows us to have a hydrophilic portion, essentially the heads here of our uh, layer here on the outside of the cell, the, the plasma membrane. We have hydrophilic heads on the outside of our phospholipid bilayer and the tails on the inside are all hydrophobic so water can be on the outside of the cell and water can be on the inside of the cell but essentially water is not going to be found there in the middle of the cell and so it has both a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic component to it water because of its polarity that it has there um, does make it so that it has relatively tight bonds in between them um, and so they stick to one another relatively nicely they're also attracted to other things in terms of the water itself and with that we get things like surface tension so we've all seen on a pond where there's little bugs kind of walking across the pond itself or even just a leaf falling into the water it will sit there and float on the surface itself until it becomes completely saturated with water and then falls in certain plants actually put a waxy kind of a coat on the outside of their their leaves and that allows them to essentially detract water and so we can see that the water forms a nice little sphere here as it sits on the surface um, and that all is because of the surface tension of the water itself and so when it pulls together the lattice that we end up seeing here we have our positive and our negative poles to it and they're going to align up with one another so that the opposites once again attract and so our our negative oxygen is going to be attracted to the positive of our hydrogen and create this nice formation within 
We saw this before when we had our glucose dissociating in uh, water. And so we're going to have our negative oxygen combined with our positive hydrogen. And that's going to dissociate the glucose molecules themselves within the water itself. If we take all the water away, that glucose will reform within that solution. Water has some nice properties when it comes to heat. Uh, it does have the ability to boil. Um, water is also special in that it is essentially the only element or the only compound that we have that can exist in all three states in an area where we can survive. In other words, it can be in a gaseous form there in the steam. It can be in liquid form as water. And then if we had little ice cubes here, it could also be in solid form in the ability for us to survive. So we can survive at all temperatures where we can see those particular substances themselves. <clears throat> in order to get water to the point of boiling, however, it needs to heat up quite a bit. And so it takes a large amount of heat in order to break all those hydrogen bonds. And so the bonds themselves are, in a sense, breaking and then reforming, breaking and then reforming, coming broken apart and then coming back together very, very quickly. And so it takes a large amount of energy in order to get that water to a boiling point where it's going to give off steam. And as everybody knows, if you're sitting there trying to boil a pot of water, it seems like it takes forever. You're staring at it and staring at it, and it just seems like it's going forever and ever before it finally gets to that boiling point. When, because water takes a large amount of energy to get to that point where it's going to evaporate off, where it's going to go into a gaseous state, that means that it's going to take a large amount of energy with it. So if we're hot, and so if we're able to, to, to get that water to be able to actually evaporate off of us, it's going to take a large amount of energy with it. And so it's absorbing a huge amount of energy as it gets to that point. And so this is part of the reason why we sweat. And so we move those water molecules out onto the surface of the skin as they evaporate, as they get to the point to where they be, go from a solid state into a, or from a liquid state into a gaseous state. Uh, it takes a lot of, of energy with it along the way. So we can use that process to allow for temperature regulation. So we can regulate our body temperature by sweating, by, by adding the water to the surface of the body itself, and it's going to then cool us off on there. Other uses for water within the body, things like uh, uh, chemically, it's our universal solvent. And so it does have the ability to dissolve substances within it, within the body. Um, everything from protection in the body, we use it in our blood as transport. That's there. Um, it's going to cushion, it's going to lubricate um, different areas of the body itself that are there. And sometimes we have to fight some of the properties as well of water in that since it does have a high surface tension. And if you've been in a biology class or a uh, chemistry class, you know that you have water filling something like a oops kind of curved that one there um filling a graduated cylinder as we fill that water into the graduated cylinder and it comes up we're going to measure it along the meniscus and so it's literally in a sense kind of climbing up those walls that surface tension of the water allows it to climb those walls in our lungs that's something that we have to fight against in a sense and so that surface tension that's there is normally wanting to try and collapse our alveoli inside there down and decrease its ability to uh, open up water very efficiently moves heat and so whether that is absorbing energy because we're uh, warming that water up or whether it's cooling us off um, as we move it it does have that ability to very easily uh, move energy and move the, the heat around from one place to the next. It is a solvent, as I said, and so we can dissolve salt, we can dissolve sugar in it. Um, many, many different compounds are going to be dissolved in it. And this is part of the way that we're going to actually be able to transport substances in the blood is that it's going to be dissolved inside the, the water that's inside the blood vessels. And we're going to utilize that for transport habits inside there.
<clears throat> so as a kid, you may have made things like Kool-Aid um, or any other kind of a drink like that. And as you added sugar to it, that sugar initially dissolved. It essentially disappeared when it was in there. But you may have gotten to the point as a kid where you added more and more and more sugar, and eventually that sugar sat to the ground. Perhaps as an adult, you do that with coffee. Um, or you go and you get your flavored coffee or something where they're, they're putting pumps of syrup inside of it. And when the coffee all cools off, you're left with this kind of sludge at the bottom that is the sugars that are remaining in partial, partial solution there. So the more solute that we get in there, the more highly concentrated it is, whether it's salt or whether it's water um, with sugar in it. Each one of those has that ability to, to dissolve and change that concentration. Once we get to the point where no longer can be dissolved, we now have a super saturated solution. The water in and out of the cells reacts with the cells themselves. And since we can dissolve substances in those in the water uh, and get it to be floating inside there, this can create a situation where we have tonicity within different fluids. And so in lab, we'll look at the, the effects of them on red blood cells. And so we have solutions that are hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic. Essentially, when we're taking fluids in, we would like to have them be isotonic most of the time. So isotonic solutions have a concentration of solutes equal to both the inside of the cell as well as the outside of the cell. Hypotonic solutions have a less concentrated solute to solvent mixture, so they're not as concentrated. A hypotonic solution would be something like just regular tap water. Um, an isotonic solution would be a, a solution of where we've added some salt into it, but not a whole lot to keep it with the same concentration as that as we have in our cells already. A hypertonic solution takes that solute concentration and ups it a little bit more. It makes it even greater inside there. So now we have a solution that is going to be more concentrated than what we have in our own cells. And because of that, that's going to move water either in or out of the cells. And so we would like to move the solutes that are there. We'd like to move the substance that is dissolved in it, but we can't always do that. And so with that, we have the concept of diffusion. And so diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And we've all experienced this as well when we've done things like um, sprayed an air freshener in a room, or maybe we have one of those plug-in type of ones that are on the wall, and the odor doesn't just stay in that corner of the room, it diffuses all across the room. It's going from an area of high concentration where we are releasing it to where it tries to get it to where we have an equal concentration throughout the entire room itself. Or same thing if we have a, um, a pitcher of water or something like that, and you just put a drop of food coloring in. That drop of food coloring is going to disperse throughout the entire, even if you don't stir it, to make the overall concentration the same uh, in the end. We just need to give it a little bit of time over uh, in order to allow it to occur. So here we have the same concept. We take a little dropper with dye in it, put that into the water, and without stirring it whatsoever, just give it some time. Eventually we have a nice equal concentration all throughout that beaker there. And so we have the same concentration throughout. This is passive diffusion. We haven't had to do anything in order to get that uh, concentration to be equal throughout the entire area. But since our cells don't just allow things to kind of freely move in between the cells and their outside environment, we have membranes that are either semi-permeable or selectively permeable. And so selectively permeable membranes don't allow for everything to move through. They only allow certain substances to make it through that membrane itself. And so we have our cell here and not all substances can get through. And so some substances can make it through other substances get blocked, another one makes it through, another one gets blocked, another one blocked, and we'll leave blue here for water. And water has the ability to make it through that membrane, even though certain substances cannot. And so osmosis is that movement of water through that membrane, again following a concentration gradient. So it's going to go from areas where it has relatively low solute, so the solutes are low, 
um, so we have a low solute concentration to an area where we have a high solute concentration on the inside of the cell in this particular case so different solutions are going to cause different processes to occur within the cells themselves and so with an isotonic solution I'll begin here at the bottom um, an isotonic solution we're going to get movement of water neither in the cell or out of the cell and so our cell itself is going to have essentially equal water coming into the cell as it has going out a cell that is in a hypertonic solution is going to have movement of water going in and out of the cell um, not in equal portions and so the water coming into the cell is going to be relatively minor but the water going out of the cell is going to be great and so the outside of the cell has a higher concentration so it's in a hypertonic solution so the um, the concentration here is high and the concentration here is small when we have a hypotonic solution once again we have our cell here now the movement of water is going to be just the opposite of what we just have we're going to have a lot of water coming in and very little water going out once again now we have a small concentration outside of the cell and a large concentration inside of the cell and so that's going to allow that water to move in either direction so we get a couple of different things that we can see within the cells themselves if we were to put red blood cells like i said in the lab inside these uh, conditions in a hypotonic solution so if we just put tap water with those red blood cells we're going to get hemolysis or hemolysis the cells themselves are going to fill up with water the water is coming in the water is coming in until that cell eventually bursts and so it's eventually going to burst open and all the water is now going to come out a hypertonic solution is going to lose water so it's going to start to shrivel up it's going to do what we call crenation and so it's going to crenate within there and the cell itself is just going to get smaller and smaller and it may even die that way as well so three different conditions three different processes going on we have our isotonic solution the cells when we look at those red blood cells under a microscope they're going to look perfectly normal they have their nice biconcave discs to them when we put it in a hypotonic solution those cells are going to start to take water into the cells at a higher rate and so they're going to start to swell up they're going to lose that biconcave disc appearance so they don't have that nice little indentation in them um, we can see that that indentation is being lost inside there and those cells are eventually going to potentially burst open with a hypertonic solution we then have the cells losing water it's coming out of the cell at all times and as that water leaves the cell shrivels up it shrinks and we get crenation of those cells that are there and so the process is there um, allow us to have different things going on within the cells and so this can be situations where we have a hypotonic solution we've overhydrated we've got too much water in the body um, a hypertonic uh, situation could be where we are dehydrated we don't have enough enough uh, water in our body itself next up we'll talk about the ph of the body itself and the chemistry that goes along with ph